Check, check, check. Test, test, test. Okay, are you guys ready? Woohoo! Are you guys ready? We're ready! Woo! I can't hear you! Ready! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay. Um, thank, you, thank you for coming to Bitcoin Tokyo meet, Meetup event tonight. This is our 127th Meetup. We are, in fact, the world second oldest Bitcoin group in the world. My name is Ken Shishido. I'm co-organizer for the group and the event producer for tonight. So, ha hello world, hello world. <laughs> um, we have a special guest from abroad this week, so I thought it would be fun to do a discussion event. Um, topic of the night is so what's the big deal about smart contract? So too bad we don't have to talk about Federal Reserve, BOJ, <laughs> government corruption. Oh, we, we can talk about that. <laughs> okay. So so Charles, so do do we have to be smart to understand smart contract? Uh, I hope not. That's the point. <laughs> or, or, or people are not smart enough so that contract need to be smart. Well, I, I, don't, I don't even know what a smart contract is. So. <laughs> okay, uh, let me in introduce our guest. Uh, Mr. Charles Hoskinson is a Colorado-based entrepreneur and mathematician. He is an ex-CEO of e Ethereum project. And I have uh, Mr. Ed Edward Egger from is an entrepreneur, web developer, and has been working on uh, reality key project. Now, w would you like to call it as certificate of authority of facts? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah? But, but, but are you sure you want to call it authority? That's what I'm going to say. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds, sound, sounds a bit scary, right? Um, or, in other words, da data feed on facts. Right. Now, Natalie is a freelance journalist, originally came from Switzerland, and now being based in Tokyo, covering mainly Japan subcultures, including Bitcoin. So, B Bitcoin is for under subculture. <laughs> She's a writer for the Daily Beast and Vice News. Well, um, let's get started. I now hand over to Natalie. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Bitcoin, the Tokyo Bitcoin Meetup. Tonight, as Ken said, I will be uh, the moderator for this panel discussion on smart contracts. And there's a lot we would like to know about. So. Um, uh, before we start, I would like to remind you to switch off the sound of your, uh, your mobile phones. And I would like to remind you that you can follow each of the speakers on Twitter. Uh, we have uh, displayed their, um, their Twitter accounts here. So please, you can you know, live tweet this event with the hashtag TokyoBitcoinMeetup. So uh, now I would like to give the floor to Charles Hoskinson and then to Edmund Edgar. Uh, and then I will be moderating the Q&A session. And uh, so Charles and Edgar, what's the big deal about smart contracts? Uh, the same as the big deal about the cloud or all those other buzz terms. Um, smart contracts are nothing new. In fact, they have existed for quite some time. The first people to think about them were the kind of the cypherpunk community back in the 1980s. And then Nick Sabo formalized most of the thoughts in a, one of his landmark papers, I think it was 97, was it? Yeah, so, somewhere around there. It was in the mid-90s is when Nick Sabo wrote it up. But basically, the idea is if you think of a contract in general, you have parties, you have some sort of transfer of value, you have some sort of terms and conditions, and there is some sort of notion of what happens when one or more of the parties doesn't follow those terms and conditions, and there's a dispute. 
So a smart contract is all about saying, hey, let's see if we can get a machine to enforce that, let's see if we can get a machine to validate that, to facilitate that. Now, where they get interesting is when we actually have a medium to store them. And that's where blockchains come into play. Because we could do algorithmic enforcement of smart contracts, but it doesn't really do us a lot of good if we have to trust a centralized entity to store that and enforce that, right? Now we can put it on a blockchain. And so that's why people get so incredibly excited about them. Okay, thank okay. you. If, uh, Edgar, do you have something to add? Uh, well, that pretty much sums up what they are. Okay, we can go um, home then, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, why, why are we so interested in them? There are just so, so many areas, everything, you know, from insurance to derivatives to employment contracts, all these areas where we've had to either deposit money with somebody who we trust, which has often worked out badly for us, especially in the Bitcoin community, um, or we've had to um, appeal for the government to settle a dispute, and that turns out to be unbelievably expensive and, and not always fair. Um, so we finally have a way to do all this stuff. Um, I mean, it's something. In, I mean, I mean, we we could take it even further back before, um, you know, before Nick Zabo. I mean, if, if you go back even back to Leibniz, it must must be what 17th or 18th century talked about this idea that once we can settle all our um, our arguments um, with a, with calculations, he, he thought that we would be able to um, to turn our arguments first into formal logic, um, and then he thought that we would be able to settle them with calculating machines. Um, his thought was that once we could do that, we'd have world peace because everyone would be able to calculate all you know all the same results. Everybody would be able to get the same answer on any question, um, and we wouldn't need to argue anymore. Um, maybe we can't go that far. But there are, you know, all kinds of areas where we can take what would have been a nasty or inexpensive uh, dispute, and we can have the computer settle for us. It just has to resolve those issues with Newton first, right? <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, as a journalist, I would like to—I have many questions, and I would like to understand uh, basically. So, um, for example, in what way uh, Ethereum is decentralized? If I understand correctly. The idea behind it is to have a standard framework with what you call Ether, uh, a sort of new cryptocurrency, and a whole new system that allows to create what we call smart contracts. So you program a contract, and, um, and then we have a service insured to be delivered. So what about the entire technical uh, infrastructure? Um, even if it's based on P2P, the infrastructure has a common database, if I understand correctly, uh, and it ensures that all the messages sent from one, from one person in the network are transmitted in the entire network. So uh, if we imagine that uh, when we receive a message that uh, would bug the system, um, you know, um, if, we, if, if a message is sent to the whole system and it does, there, there's a blackout, the, mes the message will be forwarded to the entire network. Does it mean that the entire network, network will um, uh, collapse all at once and uh, the, the software remains the same everywhere with the same rules, the same updates, uh, the same connections to the network and having the same standards, if I'm correct? Uh, so does it mean that uh, the day when you have a flaw that appears, that flaw would be implied <coughs> everywhere, I will be applied everywhere in this at the same time. In other words, uh, when there's one problem, it affects the entire system. And we are touching upon something that is way more complex than a simple transaction like Bitcoin. So the probability of having a flaw could be quite big. What do you say to that? Okay, well, that's, a, that's a fun question. Um, <laughs> So I left Ethereum in June, so I can only speak up to when I left Ethereum in June of 2014. But uh, from the designs that we worked on, uh, it's a distributed system, and it's a Byzantine fault-tolerant distributed system. So it's, that's a special type of distributed system. What does that mean? It means that when somebody wants to be a malicious actor, built into the consensus algorithm and built into the architecture of the system, there's a certain degree of resistance to that. Uh, you may hear in Bitcoin we say 51% attacks or these kinds of things. So Ethereum does have some fault tolerance. Now it's absolutely true if there's a problem in the design of the protocol itself, that problem's obviously replicated across all clients. One of our ways of resolving that was first to write a yellow paper and submit it for community review and also to implement competing clients in different programming languages. Um, uh, Bitcoin was implemented in a single programming language, it was a single architecture, and a lot of the flaws that were discovered over the years actually came from a result of 
not having competing implementations trying to negotiate with each other. For example, if you think about BitTorrent, uh, there are many different BitTorrent clients, and all of these BitTorrent clients actually have to be able to talk to each other. With Bitcoin, you can actually not properly implement the protocol, uh, but because everybody's running the same software, it's okay. So competing implementations do get some of those bugs out. Having a good testing framework gets some of those bugs out. And end-to-end -end security audit, which is what they're going through, help us get some of those bugs out. And also recognizing that these systems are experiments at their core. It helps you get some sort of appreciation for that. Uh, you know, you're gonna make mistakes. All people do. Google does, Microsoft does, a lot. Uh, and in the process of that, you say, okay, are the things that are most important, like the money I have in my account, uh, the things that are most important, who owns what, things that are most important, it's a system Byzantine fault tolerant. If those things are pretty well sorted out and locked down, then everything else is just a matter of we can iterate to a better position. And that was kind of the hope with Ethereum. Now, you are correct that Turing completeness does cause some issues. So one of them is if you don't have metered computation in your system, the holding problem is kind of a bitch. Because what happens is uh, somebody could just have an infinite loop and uh, it crashes the whole network, right? So people have to pay for computation in the network. There is also a significant scalability concern with the current architecture in that everybody has to run uh, the smart contracts in the current state. Uh, so the issue there is that as the network grows, it's going to become prohibitively expensive to run a smart contract. So you need to shard it. And that's kind of the hope for Ethereum 2 and Ethereum 3 and other architectures is to begin the discussion about how to shard a distributed system in a way that's productive for everybody. And it's important to point out that there are competing systems that can run smart contracts without the need of a blockchain. Like, for example, you could use TPMs, uh, and that would work quite well. Or you could just have a lot of magic moon math come out of the woodworks and have homomorphic encryption, code obfuscation, and ZK snarks. And then, frankly, you get the same value and productivity of a smart contract, but you can do this now on any backend, whether that be Amazon or Rackspace or uh, you know, Microsoft Azure. It doesn't really matter. So it's just one implementation, and it got everybody thinking about how to do smart contracts best. Uh, and we've seen tremendous innovations since the project was announced. For example, Ripple with Codius, uh, and um, there's the AT project, and uh, there's others like Next has been pushing very hard. And it's very exciting because we get to see competing security models, competing computational models, and some are better suited for certain classes of problems, and others are better suited for other classes of problems. It's exactly what you want to see in a decentralized movement. Thank you. And Edgar, could you tell us something about the trust, maybe with the software you... Yeah, so, okay, so, so I mean, um, Charles was, I guess, was talking about, really, about the whole system, right? So, um, is Ethereum as a whole gonna be broken in some way? Um, inside that system, you're gonna be running a bunch of individual programs, right? And anybody can write that program. Um, that program obviously has to, work correctly and give you, for, for it to work for the people who are, in, who are actually using it. But you could have a program that was work, working wrongly and that wouldn't have any particular, um, pose any particular problems to all the other people who are using it. Um, so as far as the whole system goes, um, the things that we have to worry about are, um, firstly, that there's some horrible bug in, in the protocol that will cause people to lose money. Um, Bitcoin early on had some really, what would have been, had they been exploited, really catastrophic bugs. You know, there was, there was this, the op return bug, which would have allowed anybody to spend anybody's money, you know. Um, now, Ethereum obviously has had a lot more scrutiny. It's, you know, it, it's had a lot of very smart people um, looking at it, and it's been um, built and tested with, with, um, with the knowledge that this thing is actually gonna be big and successful, you know, whereas, whereas Bitcoin, when it was first created, was a lot more experimental. And I, I think most people just wouldn't have expect, expected it to, to get as, as big as it did. Um, so, so, but anyway, so that's the first problem is just kind of dumb bugs in the, in the protocol that Bitcoin had. Um, the second problem, I guess, is, ser is problems with sort of the incentive system, um, which also is something I'm still scared of with Bitcoin. I mean, so Bitcoin has this, you know, assumption that, um, you know, you're going to have, um, if we have, if nobody controls more than 51%, hopefully people won't collude to do weird stuff. Um, and to date, that's been okay. But I don't think, but nobody has proven theoretically that that should be okay. I mean, w when you're dealing with human incentives, you really can't prove these things. Um, and I mean, and, we've, and a, a, a lot of the, these things are designed, at least you try to design them so that they can withstand 
a rational attacker. But what's much harder to de defend against is a really stupid attacker with a lot of money doing some really stupid stuff. Um, we, and if you look at what happens in actual financial institutions, you get a lot of people with really strange incentives doing very strange things. So, so I do wonder, even with Bitcoin, it may be that when we get to the point where miners are no longer these kind of gentleman anarchists, right? And you get to the point where control passes to psychopaths with MBAs who are, um, you know, who, who are thinking about their own bonuses. Maybe miners will do some really strange stuff and do weird stuff to Bitcoin. Ethereum is, in, in a way, it's been thought out with a lot of knowledge already about, about Bitcoin. So in, a, in that sense, they start with an advantage over Bitcoin. But at the same time, it's also a, a, a new model for, as I understand it, for um, things like, you know, how you do mining as a proof of stake. And, um, um, there are a lot of kind of untested ideas in there. And very soon, they're going to be put under a lot of pressure with a lot of money riding on March 20th. There you go. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, so, so I, I mean, I think there's a good chance if there's a serious problem with it, that we'll know by, you know, March 25th. Um, <laughs> but but the, there is that kind of that lack of history that's always concerning. But then just, just finally to the, the point of individual contracts, that when you're making, um, if you're just transferring, just doing stuff kind of within the terms of the crypto system, if you're just crunching logic, then assuming your program is correct, then the right thing is gonna happen. But in the real world, the big problem we have, and this is the problem that we try to help with at Reality Keys, is that if you wanna make any kind of interesting contract, you nearly always end up hooking it on something happening in the outside world, right? Something happening in the real world. Um, so you need somebody and some mechanism to actually get that data into that system. And there are, there are a lot of you know, different mechanisms. There are people who are trying to do um, something that kind of mimics the, the basic sort of consensus systems of, um, of Bitcoin and Ethereum. But it's a hard problem. And um, so um, with any individual contract, there's always going to be the question of is wherever you're going to get that data from, is that going to give you the right answer? Um, but by the way, that's also a problem we have with pretty much any existing system of, of dispute resolution. Thank you very much. So just a reminder, um, the software that Edmund has uh, programmed is called uh, Reality Keys. That's what he was talking about. So. Uh, my, next question, my next question is, um, in what way are smart contracts revolutionizing in this day and age? Do we see them as the next generation of, for decentralized transaction systems? Is it really decentralized after you know, the question I asked previously? Um, do smart contracts see some difficulties in legislations? Um, could smart contracts in some case be illegal? And do you think the laws are the same in each country? for them to work out. You want to do this for me? Okay. So uh, first in terms of law, uh, more often than not you have some freedom in what laws you want to follow if you're in a private setting. So if I'm some company and I'm another company, we can kind of choose what jurisdiction we want to settle debates at, what legal system we want to use. For example, if you're in the Islamic world, maybe you want to use Sharia law. Uh, so you, can, you have some flexibility there. Well, it turns out that you can also use private law, and this is not exactly a, a new precedent. If you look at the Middle Ages, we had Lex Mercatoria, and that was basically the law of the merchants. So they would go from country to country, they had their own courts, their own judges, their own mechanisms upon which debates would be resolved. So, uh, and the modern day analogy is maritime law. If you think if you're a shipping company, you have 25, 30 countries you go to, it doesn't make any sense to have lawyers from every single country and resolve disputes this way. So the hope is, if you have rights for digital signatures, that one can eventually use some sort of new private legal framework that's kind of global. And so the decisions, arbitrations that blockchains make, smart contracts make, will be honored in whatever jurisdiction you happen to be in. But that's a, that's a long way off, and the law tends to lag uh, tremendously so behind technology. Uh, people who are a little older will remember the NSF AUP. Anybody remember that? Okay, so it used to be that selling things online in America was illegal. Look it up, 1992, we repealed that. Uh, yeah, Kevin probably remembers, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and so, yeah, there's a legal lag there. Now, in terms of where smart contracts can be revolutionary, I think it's more evolutionary. You want to have a situation where, as technology evolves, you get cost reductions in doing business. So right now, when we do global business, 
there's a lot of costs involved in it. There's a lot of uncertainty involved with that, especially when you're vetting counterparties or trying to get predictability in the behavior of your counterparties. If you can start templating these things, having standards across the board, and also digitizing the assets, not just the cash, but the actual land, bars of gold, these kinds of things, and know that your jurisdictions you're doing business in will honor that, then all of a sudden you start getting a great degree of certainty behind how uh, your relationship is going to unfold. Does it mean we've disintermediated humans completely or courts completely? No. What it does mean is that you've created a situation where when they get involved, uh, they're getting involved for more specific things that are easier to resolve. Uh, and uh, the, the, or I should say, they're getting involved in more specific things that are harder to resolve algorithmically and you really do need human judgment. And in uh, the case of the easy stuff, all of that's taken care of by a smart contract. In some cases, you won't even require a lawyer. Now, Edmund is absolutely correct. All of these things generally do require oracles. Almost all hates. You need some sort of external data feed that the system can trust. And uh, that's a discussion that needs to be had in parallel with smart contracts, is how do we trust the feed of data coming in? Very simple thing is, let's say we want to create a value-stable currency. That could be a wonderful thing. Bitcoin is very volatile. We'd like it to be stable, but it's volatile. So contract for difference would be a wonderful mechanism to perhaps create a value-stable currency that we could use for microfinance or to be a unit of account for debts. Well, here's the problem behind that. How does your system know the price of Bitcoin? Very simple, right? You have to trust a price feed for this. Well, that's where an oracle comes into play, and you know, it's great to see innovation from shelling coin to true coin, and to also from other ideas about how to do that, and hopefully we'll be able to find a way to make that work. Thank you. And, and yeah, so, so just following up on that, I, just for people who are interested in, in this, um, I should mention um, sort of the, a, a project called Ogre, um, Augur, yeah. Augur, yeah. It's based on Truthcoin, yeah. Which is right, based on Truthcoin, um, which you might want to look up. So this is a very interesting, very clever, I think quite ambitious attempt to get these, get information about the real world without relying on some trusted person. Um, we don't yet know whether it works. Um, <laughs> if, it, if it does, you know, you may not need me to, to do what I do. Um, um, but it, it's a difficult problem. Um, Back to the kind of the broader question, I guess laws that may affect um, the kind of contracts that you're, you're going to make smart contracts, the kind of agreements you're going to make smart contracts about, fall into basically two buckets. Um, one is designed to protect the participants to the contract, um, and the other is designed to protect society from the participants to the contract. Um, the first one, um, I, I think, as Charles said, we, we can kind of think of it, it as the law lagging behind this stuff, but, but for the law to stop lagging behind this stuff is a kind of a getting to a li libertarian paradise where, for example, you know, the, the law doesn't care, the, the government doesn't have strong opinions about what kind of employment contracts would be, would be legal for you. Um, as it stands, we're going to have this situation where you've written a contract that's embodied in code. The code is, we hope, going to come up with the, the, the response that the participants designed. But if it ends up challenged in a court of law, the court may have some, some opinion that the underlying agreement is invalid for whatever reason. Um, so, so what's going to happen then is, I think what we kind of hope would happen in, in this space is, what, is that, the, um, that the, if, if, the, if a court does make some kind of judgment against the outcome, the, mach the machine generated outcome of the contract, that they're going to issue an order to the um, to the person to the beneficiary and say you've got to cop up and that they're not going to mess with the underlying mechanisms involved in the smart contract um, the other possibility here if we're dealing with um, if we're dealing with external data feeds who have reputation and known places of business which this is a, you know, an issue I, I, I worry about is it's also possible that they might go to these oracles and try to get them to enforce some kind of, of action um, and that could potentially really absolutely change the ability to do this thing, you know, cheaply and, and effectively. If you've always got to worry about some jurisdiction somewhere making some, you know, some legal decision. So anyway, and so, so 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 that's my comment on kind of the, on laws that are designed to protect uh, the, the participants from each other. Um, the other kind of uh, laws that we've got are laws that are designed to protect society from some contracts. So, for example, if if I wanted if somebody wanted to kill me, they might make a contract that if I died, this person got paid, and that would allow you to do, for example, a crowdsourced assassination contract. 
Um, now, you can't do this with the reality keys because it would be against our terms of service and we would be very cross if you did anything like that. Um, but it, I think it's, it's not unthinkable that, um, you know, that these systems will be used for that kind of thing. Um, and we, in, in the space, we need to be ready for the kind of publicity we're going to get when that happens. But didn't Amir Taki build one? He, uh, somebody, I don't know if he did one, somebody, somebody was doing escrow yeah, yeah, yeah. for assassinations. Um, somebody who, who I think was, was in favor of assassinating politicians, just as a general concept. Never mind who it was. I mean, you know, if, it's, if they're a politician, they want them assassinated. So they were, they were offering to hold on to your money and make sure that went, on, went to the assassin. But I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't even know if this is an actual original problem. I don't know if, if assassins have a hard time collecting, you know, unpaid debts. But, um, um, you, you, you know. but, but anyway, I, I, you, you can certainly like see... enforcement is built into that arrangement, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, but, but you can certainly see that there are all kinds of illegal, you know... I, I mean, any new technology is going to be used for illegal purposes, and this one certainly is. I'm certainly sure it's going to be used for illegal purposes. Yeah, one thing I'd like to add on, uh, that if you look at the financial industry, we do tend to standardize contracts. There's ISDA, there's, finance, uh, there's futures contracts, all these, these kinds of things. And the only thing that varies are the parties involved and the parameters behind the contract. Uh, what's really exciting about smart contracts as well is we're actually trying to standardize relationships between people. And once the judge understands that standardized template, then it's much easier for them to adjudicate. It's much easier for them to actually look at it and say, oh, you know, that, that makes sense. So uh, it's really exciting, and I think that's going to be a big innovation is to have kind of object-oriented law and, uh, and uh, basically legal templates for almost any type of relationship you want and to make those accessible in the developing world uh, at the first point, at, at, actually at the same time as they're accessible in the developed world, which is unheard of, right? Generally, you have rule of law countries, and then everything is kind of eh in the developing world. But now both of them have the same legal system for not only just person-to-person -person contracts, but actually business-to-business, -business, and these things can actually be built up into a decentralized autonomous organization. So it gets really exciting and kind of trippy. Thank you. So my, my next question is, um, as I understand, a smart contract is, is a process in which a computer protocol facilitates, verifies, uh, or enforces the negotiation or performances of a contract. So since smart contracts actually are made by computers, and the agreement, uh, therefore, would, for example, guarantee someone to be paid for such and such services provided. What happens if, uh, humanly, something goes wrong? If the person physically, for some reason, cannot deliver or on the other side, would the smart contract uh, continue paying him uh, on and on until the smart contract ends? Isn't it problematic? And uh, could we say that the human aspect is lacking in smart contracts? As I understand it, um, the smart contracts are also so strong, so strong that uh, different parties cannot subtract themselves from them. So the good side of the smart contract is that you can be 100% guaranteed that the contract you make with someone will be 100% honored. But on the other hand, um, if there is any kind of human error, uh, what kind of problems would we uh, would that create? Um, usually, human beings are impulsive; they make agreements and they cannot uh, provide them. And uh, if, if there is a fraud, um, how? Well, it comes to the so we were, something we were discussing previously. But how can they legally rule it? Um, is there? Um, you know, you said that judges can take care of that. Could you? Could you explain it? Okay, so first, smart contracts are written by humans. They're enforced by computers. Uh, so you use a programming language like Solidity or E or something to write them. But in terms of the, the actual enforcement, uh, if you you write a bad smart contract, just like if you write a bad contract, you get screwed. It's a basic axiom of business, right? And that's why we have lawyers. That's why you have people who are trained to do these kinds of things. Now, if you write a good smart contract, you can create escape clauses, escape hatches, where you say, given this trigger, like if a person dies, uh, then the contract is invalidated. Now, that can be programmed in, and actually, when I say object-oriented law, these things can become abstracted from your particular arrangement. So you can think of it like a module, where you import it and say, here's my dead man switch clause, or my, uh, or my uh, dead person clause, or this is my you violated US law clause, or something that invalidates the arrangement, and that only has to be written once, vetted once, and now it can be used and inherited into your system as just a single call. It's like a legal API, in a sense. So that's, how, well, that's the protection. Now, there's a transition period to get there, and there's going to be a lot of debates and mistakes and uh, 
and problems along the way, but over time, just like Amer the existing legal systems we have, eventually they get a degree of robustness over time. Thank you. Ed, do you have something? Yeah, I, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, I mean except, except that the other bit, that can, the, 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 face, the, the kind of interfaces with the human di dimension is what we were talking about earlier, where you have to get these data feeds. And, um, you know, and, and a, lot, a lot of the time, those are very kind of mushy issues, right? You know, ha has this website been built to an appropriate standard? Well, you know, that, that's quite a, a subjective question. Um, so so, so what, what's going to happen is that the smart contract is going to end up kind of defining different ways that you could make this decision, but the actual decision is still going to be human and squishy and, you know, it's all well, but it, you know wet, wet logic and dry logic. Okay, thank you very much. So now we're going to um, uh, pass the questions to uh, the people in the, in, the, in the hall. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and come, to, come here to ask it, just here. So is there any questions from the, the public? <laughs> Does everyone have a, you know, okay. Okay. The Undertaker. Uh, hi, welcome to Japan. It's my pleasure. And uh, uh, I just had one question, and uh, that is uh, when you first started up with Ethereum, um, how did you first get into that like conversation? Was it you who initiated the conversation? Were you talk? Was the conversation brought to you by someone else? Um, if you could just answer how kind of you got started with Ethereum, like who, who did you found it with? How did you guys start talking about it? Uh, things like that. Okay, so I got involved very early days. Uh, actually, it was Anthony Diorio was the person who brought me into Ethereum. So Anthony is uh, at the time he was the director of the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. And uh, we were working together on an education project. I'd ran the Bitcoin education project for some time, and I did some content, and he wanted me to do some content for BAC. And so anyway, uh, he said, you know, I got this white paper from this uh, really smart person in Toronto. His name's Vitalik, and uh, can you, I can't make heads or tails of it. Can you read it? And I said, all right, I'll go take a look at it. So I read the paper, and it was just profoundly brilliant. But at the time, I think it was an overlay protocol on PrimeCoin. So it was a, a little bit different than what Ethereum looked like today. So uh, Vitalik and uh, several other people and I, we just kind of worked together and had a lot of discussions. And over time, it started materializing to something that we could create a real project with. So we all decided, let's go down to Miami. And this was in uh, July, January of 2014. Uh, and then we went down to Miami to, to go ahead and see what the community response was. And uh, it, we turned out to be like rock stars down there. So we said, maybe we, should, maybe we should actually do something pretty bold and big with this. So that's kind of the origins there. It was very humble. It was kind of like an open source project, as many things are. I think Linus Torvald started Linux uh, in his basement, you know, uh, solving a personal itch. And in terms of Vitalik, he started Ethereum the exact same way. He was working on the Color Coins project and the Master Coin project. And he was really tired of the kludginess of the system and trying to actually get things to work properly and the fact that you had to make all these bizarre trade-offs. And he says, well, why don't I just have a damn programming language with blockchains that I can do anything I want to do with? And they said, well, that just doesn't exist. And he says, well, why can't we build one? And that's kind of the, the history. It goes deeper, obviously, but uh, we don't have enough time to go through the whole thing. Does that kind of answer your? Yeah. Um... A follow-up <laughs> question? Uh, what do you think about Vitalik and, and others doing the uh, cryptocurrency consortium? Uh, do you think that those types of uh, kind of like standards committees uh, will be important in the smart contracts area as, as well as uh, like Vitalik is saying that they will be important in cryptocurrency uh, areas? You know, Michael Minnelli at Zen wrote a wonderful paper called Voluntary Standards Markets and it kind of talks about the entire ecosystem of standards bodies. So I'm a firm believer in voluntary standards. I think they make the market better, and I think they need to be competitive. So there's not just one, but there's many, or else you have tyranny of the standard. But we're right now in a position of Bitcoin where we have a lot of people floating around who say, I know Bitcoin, and how do we validate that? There's no college degree, there's no nothing. You know, we ran into this computer science. You know, How did you prove you knew anything about computer science back in the day? I guess you're a mathematician or something. So this is just a natural response, and it's a response to enterprise adoption. Fortune 500 companies are very credential focused, and they say, well, hire somebody who's qualified, and you know, then you have to get to this really big debate. And you know, there's an old saying, no one ever got fired for buying IBM hardware, no one ever got fired for hiring an MBA from Harvard, or no one ever got fired from hiring a PhD from MIT, right? 
And so it's the same deal here. Uh, basically create some standards, a baseline set, let's create a community debate, and then what will happen is people will disagree, and we'll have new standards bodies that compete with those standards bodies. But where it gets really cool is your credentials are not owned by the agency. They actually can be embedded in a blockchain. So if that works well, then college degrees can go that way, and all of a sudden MOOCs get really exciting. So, uh, so it's, I, I actually know Michael Perkland pretty well, and um, I've given him some advice on how to structure it. And it's really exciting to see what they're doing at C4, and I hope they are successful and they spawn a lot more organizations. Do you, do you think there will be a similar type of organization uh, for smart contracts in specific? Well, he's planning on doing some smart oh, contract really? standards at C4. But yeah, absolutely. There's gonna, definitely going to be that. When I was at the Ethereum, I wanted to create a, an organization called the, C the CCRG, the Cryptocurrency Research Group. And our hope was to kind of standardize some things through that, from the protocol to a standard journal, and she put money behind research for the hard problems of cryptocurrency. And if anybody has any time, uh, Vitalik wrote up the hard problems of cryptocurrency, uh, and he actually did a presentation in Silicon Valley in March of last year. Wonderful video, it's about an hour long. It was inspired by David Hilbert's hard problems of mathematics that he did in uh, the year 1900. Thank you very much. So could you remind us when uh, Ethereum will launch? Well, I'm not involved in the project anymore, but I, I think it's March 20th. Um, that's what I've heard. Right. Is there any other questions from the... Ah, sir, please. Uh, can you speak English? Otherwise I can... Oh, okay. Um, I think I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, welcome to Japan. No, I welcome to the country of Satoshi Nakamoto and Mount Gox. Right. <laughs> okay, um, I just want to know what's going to happen by, you know, smart contracts. What's going to, what's a big innovation? What's the, what, what's the real world going to buy smart contracts? Can you give us some example? Okay. okay. Um, that's a really broad, abstract question. I can ramble for an hour on anything I want. Thank you. Uh, so if we're thinking about what's going to happen in terms of smart contracts, uh, the point is nobody knows, and so what we ought to be asking is what are the foundations and what are the systems that people are building to enable other people to figure out what to do. It's like asking Steve Jobs in 2007, what's going to happen with iOS and the iPhone and the app ecosystem? And he said, no, I have no idea, and that's the fun part, that's what makes it really exciting. Now we can imagine things, for example, you know, we have self-driving cars now, and well, you know, it's probably going to be at some point where somebody could go ahead and go to bed and rent out their car at night and just go 2 o'clock in the morning driving the streets and taxing people around and they wake up, their car's in their driveway and they've made money while they're sleeping. And smart contracts can enable that. It also enables the Internet of Things. And that's really exciting because you think about where that goes, there's 100 billion connected devices, they all have to talk to each other, they all can do interesting things, and if it's not done correctly, it's a privacy nightmare. You know, your light bulb talks to your door handle, talks to your bed, talks to your vibrator, and all of those things are connected to some sort of network, and people can know about that and sell that data to other parties. So it's really important that maybe this is done in a way that preserves privacy and done in a way that's scalable. So there's a great project from IBM and Samsung together called Adept that I recommend checking out, and that project does require smart contracts to work, especially for the negotiations between devices. So these are kind of the things you can look into the future. But here's the thing, regardless of where I think it's gonna go, why don't you learn Solidity and go on March 20th when Ethereum is released and write a smart contract and play around with it and then give us a good future, build something for us. That's the, that's the power of these tools, that's the power of Bitcoin, is that we get to build the future now, not other people. Thank you very much. So, Aaron, you have a question? This may be um, solved by my lack of understanding of Ethereum, but as I understand it, you spend ethers to execute the contract and store data and it's so meter forth. Computation. Okay. Um, so with Bitcoin, for example, as price increases, you might have the issue of transaction cost increasing. As if Ethereum price increases dramatically, could that affect the utility of Ethereum as far as being able to have contracts accessible to everyday people as opposed to corporations and so forth? Can you explain maybe why it's not an issue or if it is an issue? It is an issue, yeah. So for version one, uh, the price, I think, for computation is uh, fixed. But I, as again, I haven't been involved since June, so I don't know what they've done to the protocol since. 
but uh, this was one of the complaints Eris actually had. Uh, it costs money to run a contract. The question, should this be market set or should this be uh, a fixed cost? For the sake of simplicity, it's easier to implement a fixed cost system, but over time, one can explore different market mechanics and actually have, and this is where sharding computation comes into play, and actually that's what Codius is all about, right? So you say, I have a network of different people that I can run my Spark contract on, and each network charges me a different fee, and maybe I have different trust levels with those particular networks, and I make a decision of how much money I'm willing to spend for how much trust I'm willing to give. Now, if you want something to be completely trustless, or as trustless as it can get, then you have to pay a lot of money. If you want something to be somewhat trusted, then you pay less money, right? That's where the model is going, but you have to start somewhere. So you start at fixed fees, and then you navigate around, move around, and version two, version three, version four allow you to actually implement marketplaces. So it's kind of a minimum viable product for a smart computation, which is reasonable considering that first, the price is not gonna be terribly high probably when it first launches, and second, the network is probably not gonna be too large. We're talking about something that has less than 100,000 actors, more likely than not. But very quickly, it could grow fast, and so they need to have solutions in the queue for it. And I think they're already planning on some of those things. That's why they've, uh, they have such a large dev team. I hope that, does that kind of answer the? Yeah, I guess I didn't realize there was the possibility of changing that model as far yep. as uh, you, know, how, you can how fix you, you can fix anything. I mean, you can change anything. Either okay. either you do a proof of burn to a new chain completely, or you do a side chain and the assets migrate over, um, or you, know, you can get the the people behind the consensus algorithm to agree to change the underlying protocol. There's a great degree of flexibility with distributed systems, um, and if it's in the economic best interest of the system, then of course it will be done. Uh, and this is kind of the argument Blockstream has with side chains, right? It's Good for Bitcoin, so you know people will agree to the forks necessary to implement. Yeah, I, I think there certainly will be uh, opportunities for forking, but generally speaking, people would prefer not to change the basic of the network and how it works. And okay, yeah. So, like, uh, generally speaking, everybody's going to run on like a 1980s Unix terminal, and because it's convenient, all your apps are hard coded. That. Yeah, I use Vim too. I use Vim too, right? But no, the world moves on and the systems change in the world. And you know, we, we had to retool to desktops for mainframes and then we had to retool to mobile. Uh, then you know, now, now we're retooling for the cloud. And so we, you always retool as uh, a technology evolves. And right now we're kind of the prototype low user proof of concept phase, 2009-ish Bitcoin, but more of a, of a compressed time frame. But over time you start asking, how will this make sense for the enterprise? And how will this make sense for consumers? And then how can we localize this to different cultural needs and um, different infrastructural needs? For example, if we're talking about the developing world, almost 100% of your users are mobile, right? So you need to have a fundamentally different experience and a fundamentally different appreciation for the underlying resources of the clients, especially considering they're mobile with multi-users and you know, they share their cell phones. Yeah, so if your credentials live on the phone, that's a problem, right? So, uh, so yeah, you know, in, these are all discussions we'll have, and there's going to be a lot of experiments that are conducted. And, and at the end of the day, Ethereum may not be the most robust system. That's the problem with being on the cutting edge. Sometimes it cuts you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're coming to end this uh, this Q and A. So I would like to uh, thank the guest speakers today, uh, and I would also like to uh, thank Ken Shishido and then Homma San for actually um, being, you know, the, the in between the Japanese community and the foreign community and bringing up all this, um, this meetup uh, every week on Thursdays. So thank you very much for both of them. And of course, thank you very much for the speakers. I, I'd like to say one last thing. I'd like to thank Lux staff for giving, the stack for giving me this wonderful t-shirt. They were, Kevin and uh, John were kind enough to invite me to their office today. So I said, I'm gonna wear this shirt today. I'm not sure what they do, but it's a very good and innovative company. <laughs>